So we have three more uh, talks, and um, some people have asked about this conference. This is the most attended of it, attended that it has been. Um, this is the third, and it will continue. So next year, around this time, it'll be on a Friday, you know, within a week or two of this time. And um, I will say that I am always looking for speakers, right? And ideally, we have nine speakers from nine different social science departments and groups on campus. So, um, and usually it's a uh, faculty presentation. It's particularly good for new coming faculty to, uh, but also it can be, uh, you know, advanced uh, graduate students. And, um, I'm always open to suggestions and so on for speakers. Okay. So without further ado, um, we have uh, Jennifer Pibble from Sociology presenting on something in front of this, this my <laughs> front of this topic. <laughs> yes. um, okay, well thank you Colin um, for the invitation to be here to <clears throat> ISS for putting this together. Uh, I know a lot of your students um, so I hope you realize there are a lot of institutions where this sort of like interdisciplinary exchange of ideas and these opportunities to come together and talk aren't available, where everything is very siloed and people just sort of exist within their own departments. Um, and that's a real shame. So it's a really nice thing we have things like this. I really appreciate it. Um, and I hope, uh, hope you find it useful uh, to all of you as well. The, so I'll start with the talk today by um, explaining my motivation for topic and sort of the content uh, of this talk, it goes, it begins back in my musician days. Um, back then there was this essay or short story by Ralph Ellison where he describes um, a jazz performance and in the back of the room there's a guy by himself standing quietly by the radiator in the back of the room. You would almost miss him, you know, he was uh, sort of quiet, obscure in the back, but he's giving the performers his full attention. He's completely locked in and totally absorbed in the music. And the sort of takeaway from this story that I used to reflect on a lot was that that's the person you're, you're playing for when you're playing music. That even at like the crappiest gig where there's like very few people there and the people there are just talking and not even listening to the band, if you kind of imagine that the guy in the back of the room is there and that he is giving his full attention to the music, then that helps you sort of, uh, sort of fully honor the music and the process and yourself and sort of maximize your creativity. So uh, back when I was a musician, I used to think about the guy in the back of the room. Um, then I quit music, moved to academia, and now when I'm at the front of a room, it's, um, it's usually at like an academic conference or maybe I'm visiting another university giving a talk or something, and it's a different person in the back of the room now that I think about, and that you all should think about too. It's not the sort of quiet jazz aficionado. It's a different guy. It's the snarky jazz nerd, or snarky stats nerd, I call him. He's a, he's a snarky stats nerd, and he's in the back, and he's got his Linux machine in his lap, and he's got Twitter, and he's waiting for you to say something dumb so that he can put it up on Twitter, and he can cross out a box in his bad stats bingo card and expose you to the entire world. That's who I'm thinking about when I give a talk. And so today, I want to help you not let snarky stats nerd cross out this box in his bingo card when you give your next talk. Uh, this is my motivation, my first motivation. I'll get to my second one. The second one's much more selfish. Okay, so count data. We, when, we, when people talk about count data, we're referring to a dependent variable that reflects the number of times something happens. Some event is observed zero times, one time, two times, so forth. And there are, of course, like a number of research questions in the social sciences that revolve around <coughs> count data type questions. Uh, the reason that snarky stats nerd has linear model of counts uh, on his uh, bingo card is because the linear model, a linear regression model is an inappropriate way for modeling the sort of dependent variable um, for a couple of reasons. So, what is the correct way to do it? 
generally approaches hinge on some version of a generalized linear model that uses a Poisson data distribution assumption. And the hallmark of the Poisson distribution is that its shape changes as the expectation uh, increases. The, the mean of the count variable. As it uh, is closer to zero, the Poisson distribution has this highly right skewed kind of peaky <coughs> distribution. The more the expected count uh, increases, the kind of closer this distribution moves to a normal shape. Um, so especially when we have low expected counts, the normality assumption of the linear regression model is violated. Another reason to avoid using a linear model to model count data is that it can, when you draw a straight line, you can end up making predictions of negative counts, um, uh, which is not possible. So kind of similar rationale to why we use a logit model to model probabilities. Um, using the logit link and the Poisson data distribution, the, the logit link by applying the logarithmic transformation of the right-hand side of the model takes these uh, linear predictions, sort of forces them to be positive numbers, which is what we want when we're modeling um, event counts. There's these couple of classes of uh, count models that you see being used a lot. Either the word Poisson shows up in them or negative binomial. Um, what I, but they're, they're all based on the Poisson distribution. Um, so what I would like to do now is take the next two and a half hours to go through each of these models. <laughs> <laughs> we talk about the technical characteristics, <laughs> the pros and cons. Of course, there are a number of reasons why that's a silly thing for me to say. Uh, one of the reasons that's a silly thing for me to come in here and say is because we're all in the room right now with the person who literally wrote the book on these types of models. Um, in addition, so step one, uh, before you begin a project where you're going to be modeling count data, would be getting your hands on this book, talking to Colin, maybe taking his class. Um, there are another couple of books that I recommend that are especially useful. Um, but I'll also note that Scott Long himself says, describes Colin's book as, quote unquote, the definitive text for modeling count data. And then we're concluding the kissing up portion. <laughs> um, but no, so I'm not going to talk much about the technical specifications of the models. What I want to do is just talk about some sort of practical considerations, walk you through how a person using Stata software um, might approach modeling uh, count data, and then talk about how uh, a project I'm currently working on uh, sort of exceeds what Stata can really do, talk about some ways to hopefully um, work around some of those limitations and push things forward. So when selecting your uh, count model, the things to consider generally uh, when, when deciding which approach to use generally have to do with the distribution of your particular uh, count variable. Um, the first key issue is establishing whether you have equidispersion or overdispersion of your count variable. So the standard Poisson regression, the sort of baseline model for doing this sort of work, assumes equidispersion, which with the count variable means that the variance is equal to the mean, which in practice is actually a pretty infrequent, rare occurrence. Most of the time, researchers are working uh, with a variable that's overdispersed, where the variance is greater than the mean. When you have overdispersion and you use a standard Poisson model, your standard error estimates are downwardly biased, which puts you in the position of being more likely to reject a null hypothesis that you shouldn't, type one error, which is a position we don't want to be in generally as researchers. The negative binomial regression model adjusts for this overdispersion by including an additional error term. Um, one of the ways to check whether you have overdispersion is to estimate the negative binomial regression and then see whether this error, error term is significantly uh, different from zero. It happens by default in Stata. Um, and then there's this other, I'll, I mentioned a couple slides ago, zero truncated models, I won't talk about them today. Those are useful when you have a situation where your counts are only recorded uh, when they happen one or more times. Basically, you only start recording events when they occur, you miss all the zero observations. Um, a zero inflated model is used in the opposite situation where you have lots and lots of zero counts. For many of your observations, the event doesn't occur. Zero inflated models, I think, are very interesting. Conceptually, the way they handle this is by um, sort of assuming that there are two classes of observations in the population. There's a group 
for which the, there's no chance that the event will occur. It's always zero group. And then there's another latent group of observations that's not necessarily uh, always zero. So they can have a zero count, but there's some non-zero probability that the event will occur one or more times for that group. And what zero inflated models do, and the hurdle model sort of fits in this class as well, is estimates the probability of membership in both of those categories, or membership in the always zero category, and then estimates the predicted number of counts conditional on not being an always zero type of observation. Combines those two probabilities into a prediction. Um, Paul Allison, among others, answers this question with a probably not. Um, zero inflated models are appealing in, in some ways because they we can talk ourselves into thinking that, that, that there are these sort of dual processes generating counts, the process that predicts having some non-zero probability, and then the second process that generates the, the actual count of the event. But arguments like Paul Allison and others make generally against zero inflated models focus on the, a, a sort of overkill argument. Using a zero inflated model much, much of the time is kind of like using a sledgehammer to drive in a little bit. And at any rate, the regular negative binomial regression model generally fits the data just as well as the zero inflated negative binomial, so why make things more computationally intensive and complex to interpret than you need to? Um, so from this strictly like data-driven argument, there may be reasons to not use zero inflated models, but given that we're social scientists, we have to remind ourselves that theory comes into play sometimes. We're not just number crunchers, we're modeling some social process. There can be reasons why we would expect there to be these two separate processes, predicting zeros and predicting counts. Uh, in this, this is a blog post from Paul Allison's webpage. He gives an example of if you're modeling the number of children a woman has by age 50, um, there are some women for whom biological or physiological causes make it impossible for them to have kids. They're always going to have zero kids. Then among women who have a non-zero probability of having children, there are separate processes that determine the they end up having. In that case, there's theoretical reason to model the count generating process using this sort of zero inflated um, approach. Okay, um, I'm going to move on to some sort of hands on examples now. So, I mentioned the first thing you might look for is over dispersion. These are the data that I'm going to be um, going into somewhat more depth in with later. Uh, the outcome, this, this count. Uh, variable that I'm interested in is the number of charter schools that are opened within a school district um, over a 12 year period of time. Um, the first thing we're interested in is identifying whether there's over dispersion in this variable. Uh, so among the 10,000 or 10,500 school districts, the average number of charter schools opened is 0.5 and the variance is 11 times that. So Poisson model assumes these numbers are equal, they're very clearly not equal. Uh, you can also see the distribution of this variable is strongly right skewed and very peaky as well. Leptokurtic for the snarky stats nerd. <laughs> um, the reason we have this right skewed distribution with this strong peak down the bottom is because most school districts have no charter schools in 84% of the school districts in the country. Then you have another 8% that have a single charter school, and by the time you get beyond two or three charter schools, very uh, few districts represented. So we have this strongly sort of right skew count distribution. <coughs> okay, so what you might do is estimate a bunch of different models. Your Poisson regression, your negative binomial regression, the hurdle model, and take some of your estimates and compare them to one another. You use likelihood ratio tests to compare them. You could use those models to generate predictions and then do all sorts of interesting things, comparing predicted counts across models or comparing predicted to observed counts. And if, uh, and that could be a really good way to do things if you have lots and lots of time you're trying to kill or if you really like debugging your own code and trying to figure out what went wrong over and over again. Or, so that's the first option, or uh, what I want to show you is this uh, count fit command uh, written by Scott Long and Jeremy Fries that when using Stata makes this model comparison uh, much, much easier, much more straightforward, and lets you do some really interesting comparisons, really hone in on the type of estimator you should be using with your count data. <clears throat> so, count fit, much simpler. 
unless it's totally not and it doesn't work at all. Let me give you some background uh, really quick. So in 1994, uh, William Green points out that zero inflated and non-zero inflated models are not nested, so you need nested models if you're going to use a likelihood ratio based comparison of model fit to determine which one's better. It says they're not nested, so you need to use a different test, and he proposes using something called the Vuong test to compare um, zero inflated and non-zero inflated versions of the count model. Then Allison comes along and he's, he's all like, no, uh, and says that the models, he's like, William Green claims the models are not nested because there's no parametric restriction on the zero inflated model that reproduces the non-inflated model. This is incorrect. A simple, ouch, a simple reparameterization of the zero inflated negative binomial model allows for such a restriction, so a likelihood test is appropriate. Uh, and then Long and Freeze in 2014 say, chill out guys, no need to fight, it really doesn't matter. Even if you agree with Allison, you can still use the Vuong test, let's just use the Vuong test and be nice to one another. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm only a little bit being like facetious. If you go, so this 2012 I'm referring to is that same blog post that I showed you the screenshot of, and there's a comment section, and that comment section is like 60 comments long, and it's these two guys fighting with each other. <laughs> um, which is its own, you can do a sort of nerdiness test on yourself and go there and read that and see how much you're entertained by it. I loved it, I thought it was great. <laughs> it was like was watching a boxing match or something. Um, it wasn't anything like that. Way nerdier and more boring. Okay, um, so they're, they're disagreeing. Long and free say it doesn't matter, let's just use the Vuong test. So, um, up until, so, as of recently, let's say like Monday of this week, uh, you run the count fit command that I was just talking about, and it includes, among other things, a Vuong test of model fit that lets you compare the zero inflated and non zero inflated models to one another. Um, I'm not sure exactly when this changed. You know, I update data when I open it, but imagine my shock and dismay yesterday when I'm going through putting together slides for a talk where I'm going to show you how great count fit is, run it to start producing some output, and I get this error message. Vuong test is not appropriate for testing zero inflation. Specify an option force Vuong to perform the test anyway, but since this just happened, uh, they haven't updated the count fit command. There is no force Vuong option. There's also no like way to cut out the Vuong test, which makes the whole count fit thing blow up. But not work. So my talk, I can't do a talk anymore because I can't show you this really interesting command. Um, okay. So I know what you're all thinking right now, you're thinking, first it's global warming, then our <laughs> elected officials are behaving erratically and unpredictably, and now the Vuong test doesn't work for comparing zero inflated and non-zero inflated models. I feel, I feel your dismay, I'm in the same boat. Um, what Stata does though is it, nice, it's nice of them, they explain their reasoning here. Um, basically they point to this paper by Wilson in 2015 um, as demonstrating, like, unequivocally that you can't use the Vuong test uh, anymore. So, basically, the distribution of the test statistic for the Vuong test is not standard normal. Our p-values from it are meaningless. The actual distribution is unknown, which is interesting. It can't be used for inference. But the takeaway here, you may consider using information criteria to choose between the standard and zero-inflated models. That's something most of us are used to doing. Take our AIC and BIC, compare those, find you know, all, is, all is not lost. But the problem is the, the software hasn't caught up yet. Um, I had an old version of Stata installed uh, on my computer, and so I, could, I used that, and I went back and re-ran it. So keep in mind, the good old days is like Monday. It has changed <laughs> since then. Um, <clears throat> and this is going to be fine again someday, too, once they let us just omit the Vuong test. It's a very small part of what CountFit does. CountFit is, is awesome. I'm a big, big fan. It begins, what, what a person starts with is specifying the model as a zero inflated model. Um, when you write in Stata uh, the command to estimate a zero inflated model, you have the first part, which is the part that predicts the number of event occurrences, then after the comma, the inflate option, that's the, the other model that predicts always being in the zero category. Here I omitted all the covariates. Um, and I'm just showing you a portion of the output, but what the first, the first thing that CountFit gives you is the point estimates for the slope coefficients and their standard errors across each of the different models. And so, in this example, 
we can go through and you see it, the thing that jumps out at me first is that the negative binomial and the zero inflated negative binomial are pretty different uh, with respect to the coefficients they're predicting for the effect of being in a, this is an established Latino gateway uh, school district on the number of charters that open in that school district. These are, I believe, exponentiated coefficients. So like odds ratios in the count model world, we call it incidence risk ratio, IRR. Um, so, so I wrote it with an interaction in there. You can, so you can specify the, you know, a complex model, the, the thing you're actually going to end up interpreting down the road. One caution I would give you, though, is so count fit, what it does is it actually goes and estimates each of these models, which is uh, quietly in the state of parlance, so like behind the scenes. If you have convergence problems with any one of these, you won't see it. You know, it'll just kind of look like it's frozen and will never finish, but you can't see where the problem is. So I recommend going through and fitting each one of these individually just to make sure they're all going to converge before you use count fit. Um, at the bottom, so this would go on for as many covariates as you have in your model, and then down at the bottom you have these fit statistics. If you just take the AIC and DIC and read across, it looks like our negative binomial models are going to be preferable to the Poisson ones. Um, the next thing, count fit spits. So this is just one. I, I just wrote count fit and then my model, and all of, the, all of what follows comes out. For each of the models, it gives you the uh, value of the count variable for which the estimator is most wrong, basically. The difference between predicted and observed counts. Um, so the Poisson model is most wrong for predicting zeros. It underpredicts them. This is pretty common. Um, the negative binomial and zero inflated negative binomial, their biggest wrongness is substantially less than the biggest wrongness for the Poisson models. You can get the, it gives you the average wrongness over here. So other measures of which model is doing the best job of fitting the data. Then it'll give you this sort of table once for every estimator. It gives you the um, actual probability of a certain count, the predicted probability of that count based on that model, the difference, whether those differences are significant, adds up the total wrongness over there. And so you can sort of read across these four tables and get a sense of how these different estimators are doing. Then CountFit gives you a graphical presentation of that same sort of information. So here it's the observed minus predicted um, uh, counts at each uh, value of your count variable. Um, what you want to see is lots of is basically zero. You want to see that your observed and predicted are the same. Oh goodness. Poisson's doing a terrible job. Negative binomial and zero inflated negative binomial seem to be over there. Last thing you get is this formal comparison of the different fit statistics. Um, it's nice over here, you get a sort of narrative summary of how strong the evidence is for one over the other. It tells you which one is preferred over which. This is that godforsaken long test that we should not pay any attention to. But this table gives you a summary of sort of which model is doing the best job. So running this one command does all of this work for you, lets you uh, sort of hone in on the one model that's going to be best. Okay, um, so the last, the last piece that I'll talk about today, the title of the talk, right? Multi-level, I haven't talked about multi-level models at all yet so far, but each of these, you know, uh, hypothetical questions that I started out with could be thought of as a multi-level sort of process, whether it's repeated measures within observations over time or sort of spatial or bureaucratic clustering of observations. It's nice, it would be nice to be able to use multi-level models, fixed, random, mixed effects models with this uh, sort of zero inflated framework to model these count outcomes. There's no reason that this shouldn't be possible. So each of these are just a sampling of papers laying out how uh, it's how someone would use a multi-level framework, a random effect framework or a mixed effect framework with a zero inflated count model using, in this case, SAS with PROC and all mixed, MIMDEP, S plus, but conspicuously absent from all this is the STATA. There is no uh, sort of prepackaged or user in uh, set of commands that would let you do multi-level modeling with zero inflated, for zero inflated count data. Um, Here's my, I want to make sure I get to this so that smart people in the room can tell me whether this is okay or not. So I'm, I'm not sure. Here's my proposed workaround. What I'm interested in here, so I'm measuring, or I'm, I'm trying to model the, the number of charter schools that are formed in school districts across the U.S. over time. But there's reason to suspect there will be sort of between-state variation for a number of reasons. 
chiefly policy differences that some states don't have any laws that would allow you to open charter schools. The laws that have been passed in certain states were passed at different times, having sort of different period of risk for charter schools even being opened. Uh, what I want to do is make within state comparisons. I want to use state fixed effects when estimating this um, zero inflated negative binomial model. So my approach to doing it is to include state dummies in both portions of the zero inflated negative binomial model and then use cluster standard errors at the state level. Is this okay? It's, uh, this was my best sort of shot at doing what Stata doesn't have a, a mechanism for letting you do, as it stands. And the last little trick I'll show you, because I'm sure I'm pretty much out of time. Am I all the way out of time? No, two more minutes. Two more minutes. Uh, so the reason I have this version 14.2 up here, if you're using version 15, the list cof command doesn't work, hasn't sort of been updated, but this is a little trick where you can call up a previous version of Stata to make commands work with each other. One of the downsides to using this approach to fixed effects is I get, there's like 52 states, because we have DC and Puerto Rico. Uh, so I have that many dummy variables twice. You know, I have once in this uh, first part of the model, once in the second part, so I have you know, 104 coefficients that are just sort of meaningless. I don't want to look at them. List cof lets you select uh, the independent variables that you want to see coefficients for, and lets you sort of tailor how you want those coefficients presented. How I ask for them to be presented is as the raw coefficient, the test statistic, the p-value, and then these percent columns are really, really handy for these sorts of models. You get the percent change in the expected count for one unit increase in x or just one standard deviation increase in x. And the other thing I really like is that next to the one standard deviation increase in x column, it gives you what the standard deviation of that variable is. It's a small little thing that's very, very handy for interpretation. Because my model has interactions, this actually isn't a very good way to make to interpret things. It's a logistic regression model. Interactions in logistic regression are complex. The margins and margins plot commands work very well with uh, zero inflated negative binomial, zero inflated plus on. Sorry, I'm rushing and like wearing myself out. <clears throat> what I have here is the, so the predicted count of charter schools in school districts. Um, uh, as the change in the percent of the school age residential population is Latino over time in the previous decade, increases separately for school districts that are established Latino destinations this time, and non-established destinations. The interpretation here is like, when the Latino child population is increasing in relative size, and that's a new phenomenon, when there didn't used to be Latino kids in the district, a bunch of charter schools open. It's not exactly the same thing in a destination, <coughs> sorry, a school district that has a longer history of Latino child. This is the average marginal effect of destination type. It's a way of doing a significance test with the two slopes. Um, with the confidence interval doesn't include zero, it's an indication of a significant difference. So you interpret this as like, once the Latino child population increases by more than about 20 percentage points over the previous decade, uh, you see this significant difference between established and non-established testing. Much more slides. But we'll stop there. Sorry for rushing. All right. Thank you. Any questions? Well, I'll just say. Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, so, my students here somewhere. We've been, um, we have a data set that is not count data. It's Officially, the percent of time that students have sort of behaved in class on the zero to ten scale, with ten being very behaved and zero being not at all behaved. Mm -hmm. um, but if you were to look at the distribution, it looks a whole lot like a Poisson distribution. And we've been going back and forth about whether or not to just treat it as a Poisson distribution, even though it's not count theoretically, or to try to come up with something else. And I was wondering if either one of you had a, given that this is the topic of your talk, if you had a, an opinion about that. So if you treated the, so it looks kind of like one of these. It, it looks it looks like the, the first black line. Yeah. So Poisson distributions are typically described as rates, you know, in terms of rates. Like, I thought of like, I don't know, the rate of good behavior. I don't know. This is another one where I shouldn't be answering it. Should we call it? <laughs> so I'd say on that one, 
if it was a continuous measure between 0 and 100, you can rescale it to 0 and 1 and do a logical probe model. Is what I would do in a proportion statement. Right. I think that would be, now you've got some lumpiness, but still, I think that's what I would uh, consider doing. Because right. uh, a logic model, you can apply not just to 0, 1 data. It's for something where the conditional meaning lies between 0 and 1. And similarly, I'd say with the count data, the count data is not restricted to counts. It's really for any model where the conditional meaning is exponential x transpose beta. And um, so that answers that question. Uh, just a couple other things. With the fixed effects, by the time you get to a quite parametric model, you have the incidental parameters problem. So the fixed effects are in the states. As long as you have a considerable number of observations per state, you'll be okay. But in your example, it may be that you want to drop some small states, you know, states just have a couple of observations. Mm -hmm. But there will be an incidental parameters problem. But I think, I don't know, what, by the time you get up to, well, certainly 30 observations per state, it'll be fine, maybe 20. And then you gave this uh, introduction. I would say um, another big reason for doing counts, two reasons, I mean, doing this plus on. I think in most applications with counts, when X changes by, you know, if someone gets a year older, I don't think that means 0.3 more visits to the doctor. I think it means, a, what, a 5% increase. I think all the effects are multiplicative, right? And in that case, you either want y has conditional mean exponential x transpose beta, or you could go log y is exponential, right? If you go the log route, you're taking the log of zero at times, which is problematic. But also, at the end of the day, I want to predict y, not log of y, right? And then the other reason for doing it is that how hard is it to go from regress yx, comma VCE robust to plus on yx VCE robust? Right? Once upon a time, it was an impediment. Um, and then on long and freeze, it's a really good book. Right? The book that Pravda and I have on counts is more of a research monograph, uh, so it's doing much, you know, more. Right? It's just not going to be emphasise the basics as much. Long and freeze is very good, and also. The state of book the problem I have, the chapter on counts, is kind of the essentials, and that they're better places to, to start. This has been a lot of fun, actually, and it's unusual for us to have so much detail on a given sort of data, and I think in future times, next year, we'll have one on something else, maybe duration analysis or something. Oh, and finally, with counts, you the data often requires you to get parametric, right? There's often sensory, right? There's often truncation. You ask people who actually came to the doctor's office, how many times did you come? But you don't see the ones who never came. So you are forced to be parametric to do anything, right? And I think things like negative binomial actually these work quite well. Yeah. Great, thank you. All right, so next we have uh, Megan Welsh from uh, the education oh, School of Education. <laughs> So I'm, I'm Megan Welsh, and I do actually know what year it is despite my, my slide. Um, I, I work in the School of Education, and I am a psychometrician. I care a lot about measures and how we measure um, what people know, think, uh, believe. So one sort of uh, shift in thinking that I think is necessary to move into the world of psychometrics is that um, I am no longer interested, or in many cases not interested, in thinking about the effect of something on people where I am sampling um, in people or districts or some sort of organization from a population of, of people. Instead, um, the work in psychometrics starts with the idea that there is some sort of infinite universe of items that we sample from to create a test. And so what I am interested in is, is statistics around items. Just as when we're measuring people, we have measures both on, on say, test items and on people. When we're measuring, when we're evaluating the property of test items, we do the same thing. We have some data on people and on items. But it takes a little bit of a shift in thinking to think about the fact that 
What I care about um, when you're dealing in, in measurement is, is the um, is the inferences we can make about items, not about people, because both sorts of variables are, are in my analyses. So uh, on that note, most of what I'm going to talk about today sort of falls within the realm of something called test validity. Current, if you've, if you've ever taken a psychometrics class, and it's at, at all, all been a while ago, you should know that sort of the definition of validity has changed relatively recently. And what, what we're really concerned about is the degree to which evidence and theory support both the interpretations of test scores and the proposed uses of them. So we're not only concerned with, when you look at a score, did a kid, how well does a kid understand math, but we're also interested in how that information about how someone understands math is being used. Can you use that information to make a change in policy? Um, it would be appropriate for that use. Would it be appropriate to make an inference about how good a job a teacher is doing? Those are the types of things that we need to sort of additionally investigate, whereas um, even so recently as, say, less than, you know, less than 10 years ago, we were only concerned with interpretations. I'm today going to talk about something called instructional sensitivity, which is one aspect of validity. And what this has to do with, it does have some policy relevance, is the degree to which students' uh, performance on a test reflect the quality of instruction. That students um, that students are receiving. So you may let's see if I have one slide. so you may be familiar with with lots of educational reforms that have come out where we tend to um, quite explicitly make inferences about schools or about teachers based on on student level test scores. So under No Child Left Behind, there was a lot of very sort of uh, rigorous evaluations of schools based on test performance. More recently, in states um, outside of California, California lives in some ways in this wonderful, wonderful bubble. Uh, teachers are now being evaluated in this way. So there are, are many um, states in which there's a state-level teacher evaluation system where student performance on tests aggregated up to the teacher level is used to decide whether to label a teacher as someone who's successful or someone who is failing and therefore needs sort of intensive intervention, extra professional development, um, extra supervision from their principal. Uh, and so, so in particular, what I'm concerned about is the way that we think about tests capturing the effect of, it can be teachers or schools, but I'm going to focus on teachers today. I also want to point out that in, in many, many areas of research, we use test scores as a, proctor, as a proxy for the effectiveness of some intervention that we're having teachers implement. Right? So this isn't just a policy um, concern. This is an educational research concern from the perspective that we often do things to teachers and then see if that thing we did to teachers or we train teachers to do differently changes how kids do. And, and in reality, the way that we tend to evaluate tests for, um, in terms of test validity never takes into account whether or not they can be used to make inferences about instruction at all. And in fact, uh, there's a fair amount of work by people like Bruno Zumbo at the University of British Columbia who has looked at things like the factor structure of, uh, of measures when you measure them at the, at the individual level, and then the factor structure when you measure them at, say, the group level. And with the same data set, you can have entirely different factors at the student level. And then when you aggregate up to the teacher, it looks like you're measuring different constructs altogether. And this talk today is going to focus specifically on instructional sensitivity of items. There's also been a lot of work on instructional sensitivity of tests and, and on, the, on the scholarly side of things, not, not in the test developer side of things. And I'm particularly interested in item level evaluation because it gives us information about which test items we have to improve in the test development process. So as I said, uh, tests and item sensitivity are not currently evaluated by high stakes testing programs at, at all. My advisor and I wrote a paper evaluating the, item set, the test sensitivity of a test in Arizona, and I think it was 2008, and that's the last published piece that I'm aware of that looks at this, at examining a particular instrument. When we think about item sensitivity, there is no one established method. And the, the reason for this is that when you think about how, how large-scale tests are structured, 
There's usually about 50 items per test. There's thousands of teachers per state, hundreds per district, and um, 25 students per classroom. So we have a, a problem where we often don't have, um, for the number of items we have, then when we get up to the student level, things don't estimate correctly because we don't have enough, enough students to then, to then make good teacher estimates. So uh, historically, sensitivity has been evaluated just with uh, quasi-experimental approaches. One approach is that you give a test, you hire to a group of kids, you have a teacher provide instruction on the content of the test, and then you give the test again. And there's a bunch of different statistics you can calculate to think about the differences in the pre-test and post-test scores. If the items that go up the most are the most sensitive to instruction on average, and the ones that don't change must not be sensitive to instruction, right? So if the if it gets much easier to answer the item, it's a good item, and if it's not, a, if there's no change, it's a bad item. There's also some work in this field called opportunity to learn, where we actually go out and measure what teachers are doing in classrooms. You know, are they teaching the skills that are on the test? Are they doing a good job of teaching those skills? How much are they emphasizing what's on the test? And also putting in some other things like um, overall achievement and student demographics to think about how well these two things predict item performance. If things like teaching the skill that's being, that, uh, that the item is measuring improves the probability of answering of getting the item correct, then it's an incentive that it is a sensitive item. And if, if OTL doesn't seem to predict item performance, then it's not. Uh, there's a couple of problems with this method. One is that it's, it's burdensome because you have to do da additional data collection beyond collecting operational test data. So operational test data is just like the stuff you give to kids in the testing moment. Oh, I, let's go back. Uh, if, if we use something um, like this in particular and the instructional effect, if you think about a state test, it normally gets at measurement and it gets at number sense and it gets at geometry and it gets at algebra. So you end up having to have a lot of different lessons here to measure the effect of instruction on the test. And in addition to that, figuring out what's actually going on in a classroom is really, really, really hard because there are about um, 180 days of instruction and things change a lot day to day, right? I bet um, anyone here who's actually taught even in a university classroom can sort of acknowledge that any given lecture may, may be their best lecture or maybe not quite their best lecture. So I've been playing around with, and I really do want people to um, provide other ideas here, partic um, statistical models that we might use to figure out, to get at item sensitivity. And what I've been doing is borrowing a lot from the teacher effects literature and trying to think about teacher effects on item performance. I want to acknowledge that there's this whole literature out there on teacher effects or on things like called multi-level measurement models. The people who write these papers aren't even aware that instructional sensitivity exists. And the people who are aware that instructional sensitivity exists, for the most part, um, are not methodologists. So there has been very little sort of meeting of the minds here. And so here's what a multi-level measurement model looks like. What we're talking about is, is predicting the probability that a student answers an item correctly with the item level performance on all the items on the test, except for that one item that, they, that, that you're predicting. And then we have, um, when we have student level estimates, so we're taking the, the clustering of the items within the student into account. And um, in, in an IRT model, which is again, predicting the probability of answering an item correctly, we would have a random effect just for the, um, the intercept at the student level. And so what we can do then is estimate the, you know, we have a probability of answering the item correctly that's based on the student level random effect, which Jason just referred to as, um, or Jacob just referred to as, um, as, as error or noise. But in our thinking, if it's, if it's at the student level, then it's something about the, stu the student's difference from the typical student is a characteristic of how much the student knows. And then we take off the item difficulty. And it's, it's a, logistic, a logistic model. Questions about this model?
We can add a third level to get to that teacher effect. And again, I, at the, when we're just treating it as a measurement model, not trying to get at the teacher effect on each item, we just have an error term on that for the, for the teacher here, which is sort of the teacher, the difference between of, the, of a given teacher from the average teacher, right? That's that residual. And now the item, what you know is now a function of both the, the characteristics of the student, whether they're above the residual or not, and the characteristics of the teacher, whether they're above the average teacher or not, minus characteristics of the average item and the particular item. So this is just, if you've heard of item response theory, this is just item response theory written as a multi-level model. If I want to estimate the actual teacher effect, now I have to add in a whole bunch more error terms, right? So each one of these is the, um, the average student effect on a given item, right? And then this is the, the difference of any of a particular student from the average student, right? So this is the student level residual for, for item two, and this is the one for item three, and this is the item one for item four, so I can see how much variability there is in student performance around each item. And then I have the same thing for the classrooms. How much variability is there um, of, of teachers away from the average teacher level performance in terms of the probability of answering specific items correctly? And again, I've moved from the world where this is noise to where this is some sort of meaningful effect of a teacher. Given what I said about the structure of my data, can anyone predict what the problem is with this model? So you can assume these, all these errors are normally distributed? Yeah, that's... IID normals, is that...? Well, I would have to, except, um, except think about if I have 25, 55 items, Instead of B, K minus 1, J, it's literally beta naught to beta 49. And then at the student level, <laughs> um, I only have 25 students to estimate the variability around each item, average item performance. And at the teacher level, I've got, you know, hundreds, at least hundreds of teachers here. So here's what happens when I actually try to run it. It just won't even converge. Right? Because my number of, of, of I because what I'm trying to estimate, the number of parameters I'm trying to estimate is greater than the number of observations on data points I have. And in fact, when people sort of um, study multi-level IRT and do simulation studies usually around this, they're almost always focusing on about five items. And I'm pretty sure that more than five items is where things just won't converge. So the problem we really have is that the way that we're approaching multi-level modeling from like a basic research perspective doesn't actually, doesn't actually apply to sort of operational testing environments where we're dealing with 50 items per, per grade level. Yes? How many students would you need for the models to converge? I'm thinking about like schools where a teacher may have several different classrooms of the same subject so that in effect, they have more than 25 students, but even then, it might not be enough. So, there's so, so in the high school level, this might work. In in the high stakes testing world, there's usually sort of one grade level in high school that 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 has a test. Um, so that's a really good point, and I haven't played around with the high school level. There has been some um, work around a different kind of modeling that I'm going to present that has found that things sort of hold up pretty well once you hit around 50 students per classroom. Mm -hmm. So I have two, two workarounds I've been playing with in, in an applied way. One is that I, I just estimate the two-level model, where I estimate the variability around the student, and I sort of drop the teachers, uh, sorry, around the classroom, and I drop the student level out altogether, right? And if I drop the kids out, I can get classroom-level residuals. And if I do that, if it, in, in the, um, you might have heard something called value-added modeling. In the education world, it was a, a buzzword for a while because it was, it's the way that test scores are used to evaluate teachers. And what you do essentially is fit a regression line for each student, predicting their, their test score based on prior performance and lots of student demographic characteristics. 
and then you look at the magnitude of the residual, the difference between the predicted and the observed score for that student, and you aggregate all those residuals up within a classroom, and if on average kids are doing better than predicted, then the teacher must be successful, and if the kids are doing worse, then it must be the teacher's fault. So I, I sort of borrowed that idea, and instead, though, what I've done is I've sort of aggregated up the, um, the student level, the, sorry, the classroom level residuals around each item. Sorry, I've done the student level residuals around each item, and then I've aggregated them to the classroom level, but instead of looking at the mean residual, I'm looking at the variability between the classrooms and the mean residuals. But this is like, I don't know, it's like a back of the envelope, not, not necessarily statistically correct approach. Um, and then the other approach I've used is something called item difficulty variation, which is developed by Kaffer and Kabili. And at this point, they also just sort of get rid of the student. They, instead of looking just at the student level, they get rid of the students and just look at the classroom level. And so this is a very similar sort of situation where they've got the average classroom test performance and then they think about, um, then they take off what would be sort of the average difficulty for an item, the difficulty of an item, and they adjust it for sort of the mean test performance across the state. So is this item more difficult than typical items or less difficult? And then they add in uh, um, a random difficulty item. That, and that's associated with sort of how much more difficult is this item in this classroom after we've accounted for average performance in the classroom and difficulty of the item, of di in general difficulty of the item. Um, this, this will converge and run, so I can, but you'll notice that as opposed to this model, where I've incorporated all of the items into one model, this has to be run item by item. So when I do that, what's the big problem if I have 50 items? This is like a very basic statistics question. And I have several graduate students in the room who I'm not afraid to call on. <laughs> yeah, I have like a type 1 error issue, right? Where I'm sort of testing things over and over and over again. And when you get to 50 items, the, the, if you want to even make some sort of post hoc adjustment, you're talking about very, very, very small numbers. Very, you have to have a very small probability of, of having the result by chance in order to have it work. It also ignores the student level information altogether, which seems, seems problematic as well. So these items, I mean, are they likely to be independent each of those tests, or will there be positive correlation across them? Uh, the, the tests? When you do the, the, 50, the 50 items. So the items themselves, um, in most testing situations, are assumed to be independent. That's quite common in, in, te in the testing world especially when you get to situations like um, if you've taken, uh, ever taken like a language arts test, usually you read, you read a passage, right? And then you answer several items from the passage, and so we know that they're not really independent because they're all linked to the same, the same passage. Well, I think it's not so much the item itself, but the statistic that you're using uh -huh. that you're getting at the end for the item. <coughs> the probability of answering it correctly? No, I think if you... You said this problem with doing on the next slide. Oh. Oh, ignore student level information. Yeah. No. Yeah. I thought you said that doing this test separately, 50 times, this thing. Yeah. Oh, so I do the items 50 times. And so you are right that, that um, you can do this either where you get the overall item we take the um, overall test performance into account, right? And so there are models that sort of take overall test performance holding out the item that you're evaluating. So it's overall test performance on, say, 49 of the 50 items one at a time to adjust for that fact that the item would be, be part of the, the ability measure. Is that the question? I can talk about that. Okay. There's a final general approach I want to talk about, which is called multi-group confirmatory factor analysis. And what we do there is we have a factor analysis, but we, we um, where we have a factor loading, we have in item indicators that are sort of loading, um, that are predicting math achievement, they're indicating math achievement, we've got sort of an average performance of the item difficulty, and we've got the relationship between the item and the blade construct, that's the, the uh, lambda there. 
and we, we can create these sort of factor models for, um, often you will see these when we're validating tests where it's just for all students all together. But we can run them for sort of at the teacher level. So we do it for each classroom or for each school. And then we can compare whether or not both the difficulties and the loadings are equivalent across the classrooms. And if there are any differences in the relationship between the item and, say, overall math achievement, then we take that to mean that, that there's something different about what math achievement looks in this classroom that's related to the item. So if, there, if this is a stronger relationship and this is algebra, and over here there's a stronger relationship here and it's number sense, then we're going to assume that this teacher teaches number sense really well and this teacher teaches algebra really well. And we want, so then we could make some inferences about differences in instruction or teacher effects that are being detected. But in reality, the problem we have is that when you think about multi-group measurement in various but these kinds of studies, again, we're normally talking about small numbers of groups, often just two. But if we have even, say, one data set I was working with, I had 40 teachers, now I have 40 different CFA models to compare. And that, again, um, doesn't really, it, it will actually converge. I will give it that. But it won't generate fit statistics, which seems like a pretty big problem. And I had a student who worked on that because she was really convinced that the fit statistics um, were not a problem. So we ran some simulation studies and found that, uh, that our parameter estimates were really, really biased, that we couldn't, couldn't trust them. Although if you um, move up to clusters of 100 students in a classroom, um, Asperohov and Mutane suggest that it, it does work. Okay. So that's sort of, it is just different ways I've tried to run these multi-level measurement studies and the problems with trying to generate, to try to think about the teacher, of uh, the effectiveness of a test to measure instruction given the way that schools are structured today. Questions or thoughts? Things I might try that I haven't tried yet? <laughs> So when you say it will not converge, what does it mean? Well, converge? Yeah, it, it means in a competition it takes too much time, or it's not identified, or it, 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 it basically gets looped up and never generates estimates. Like okay. you can leave your computer on for five days. So and you can, you can adjust like the number of iterations yeah. um, upwards to the point that it seems ridiculous and it won't ever actually hit the, um, it will never come to a, a solution. Do you know what is the problem? Uh, so identification uh -huh. is not like justified, or like, you know, maybe if you change algorithms, it's like somewhere. Yeah. Or, so I, I've actually um, talked to people <laughs> when I was trying to, to make this this particular stuff work here. I actually spent some time with uh, with Linda Mutain. I don't know how many people are with, with M plus, but it's a it's a very big sort of um, very popular psychometrics package. It also isn't does a lot of interesting modeling really in general, and they just kept saying. So you're trying to estimate 4,000 parameters with 12,000 participants. Like, that's just a silly idea to begin with. And, and um, in particular, this approach, we went, you know, we used Bayesian attempts because, Bayesian modeling, because it, it is better at dealing with um, small numbers of a small sample size. But you can't fix everything with Bayesian statistics if, you, if you're trying to, you know, make, make too many inferences from too little data. There's very little, I think, you can actually do about it. Because that's the conclusion I'm coming to. Um, is it is it correct to say that there's that none of these methods will let you recover uh, the fame classroom between student variance estimates that the, the number of students is too small in any classroom? I um I, uh, so so what I can do is if I take the classroom out, I can get between between student variance estimates. So I, I, what I, one of my workarounds was to sort of get rid of level three and just look at the, at the um, between student variance estimates and then to take those estimates and aggregate them up to the classroom and by hand get a proxy um, between classroom variance estimate by just calculating the variance between the aggregate classroom, you know, these aggregated residuals. So that was my um, back of the envelope approach, but I'm sure there's all kinds of reasons why that's a bad idea. I don't, I don't know. I was waiting for someone here to be like, why on earth would you ever do that? 
But that was that's the closest thing I've come up with. Okay, so this is one of the big divides between economics and the rest of the world. We do not do multi-level model, <laughs> right, except for random effects model. And that's why I'm not well equipped to, uh, probably couldn't anyway if I knew it, but uh, I'm not the person to ask. But I'm curious to know, first of all, who here actually is part of their research, either now or expect pretty soon, to be doing multi-level modeling? Right? So we're in two different worlds here, okay? And then second question is, um, he already came up once to an ag, e ag and resource economics, but it wasn't well advertised. Chuck Huber from Stata will give a talk on structural equation modeling. Who would be interested in having him come here to do that? So you know that psychology offers amazing structural equation modeling classes too? Are you familiar with that? Uh, yeah, but the thing is, a class is a class. That is true. Right. <laughs> and one of the benefits of this is, you know, much more efficient. Uh, yeah, and I can read books and so on, but uh, there's many things I need to know, and the people around me don't do structural equation modeling. Um, I've actually worked on it because, and it's just a question of time as to how much we put in the new edition of Microcommerce Season State, just to point out to uh, people who don't use it, what they could could be missing out on. But anyway, I'm just saying there's two different worlds. Uh, yeah. uh, so this isn't really a stats question, but would you be able to get anything from grouping items together? So that's the one. There are these things called um, differential bundle functioning and differential testlet functioning models yeah. that do allow for clustering of items. And that is actually the next place we're starting to, to move. Um, I'm still trying to really figure out I understand sort of theoretically that the testlet, the items are clustered the way that Colin was describing. Um, and death bundles, they're not cons they're considered to be independent, but I'm not deep enough into like the, the meaningful differences in the models yet to feel comfortable running them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. I closed it and it went to sleep, I think. Oh, that might be probably the last one. Okay, so our last speaker uh, is Eduardo Strada from Psychology, and I'll give you a five minute warning. Uh, 25 minutes. Thank you. <coughs> well, good afternoon. Uh, I, I am a postdoc scholar in the psychology department. I will be familiar with that, and I'm going to share some ideas and things we have been working on. And I would really like to hear your comments about it. So if you feel free to stop me and say anything. For this project, we are collaborating with some colleagues in the University School of Medicine. Uh, this is, I'm talking about a general method we want to propose, but in this context, we apply it to uh, reading abilities, and the development of reading abilities. So, in pretty much all fields, identifying change at the individual level is very useful, particularly in psychology. 
right? For example, if you are a physician and you are uh, applying an intervention, a behavioral intervention, you might want to know which particular persons are not changing or are not changing enough, so they need some pharmacological treatment, for example. In the context, in the context of education, the usual question you often have from educators is, okay, tell me which children are not catching up with the rest of the class. Which ones, which specific person uh, need an intervention, for example. And the traditional methods for this, the classical statistics, focus on samples, on the whole sample, aggregates, like mean, for example. So our purpose here is to propose a method that can predict individual change uh, and uh, identify the scores that shows that that person is not changing enough, or is changing too much, more than it's expected. And one of the things that we I'm drive by is I try to propose things that can be actually used by people. And when I see people, I don't mean the people in this room, I mean the people in schools, which often don't know, don't know as much as we do about statistics. So I try to keep things simple with the group that I'm here. <coughs> that might have some problems too. You can tell me about it if you detect something. So what are we doing? Linear regression. How many of you have, have used linear regression? <laughs> Some people have read books about linear regression. How many of you has computed the confidence interval for individual predictions in the linear regression? So this should have, there should be a, a hat here. here. Uh, for that. So when, in a linear regression, let's assume this is the pre-score. We, we have two time points. This is time one score, this is time two score, the prediction of time two score. So we are trying to predict what is going to happen at time two with time one. And for this point estimation, we can compute a confidence interval with some confidence level. And the way people usually do this is, okay, for the people, with, for the person with this level at time one, what is going to be the mean level at time two? And the confidence interval is for the mean of this previous level. But you can also um, compute the confidence interval for, the, for each individual prediction. Are you making sense? Uh, so the only thing that's about this change slightly, and the, the way of computing the standard error is different too. It's pretty much straightforward. Just a different computation, different format. So very basically, you know how this works, but I'm going to preview it. These are the scores of pre, time one, this is the score of time two. We fit a linear regression with a simple linear regression. This would be the, the prediction for a given level of pre scores. The confidence interval for the mean has this shape very often, and the confidence interval for the, for the individuals are much, is much wider. It's also core, but we don't appreciate it. So how is it, how this can be used to interpret individual change? Well, we can block people here, we can block persons here. This person changed exactly what was expected for him or her. This person improved change more than it was expected for the group but still is within the confidence interval, this person improves significantly better than the people with these scores of pre. And this person improves significantly less, a bit worse than the, it's expected, even if he or she actually improved, because this score is higher, sorry, this score is higher than this, but it's not, it's not improving at the rate that it should be improving when you have the whole population. So, one of the things that I have to do is that I'm talking about individual, I'm talking about at the individual level, but I use data from the whole sample, okay, as compared to single case uh, designs, for example. So we basically use the regression residuals as a measure of departure from typical individual change, and we can set the conf uh, conf uh, confidence level, whatever confidence level we want. Um, Approximately 5% of the cases from the typical population should change, should show a typical change. If we, if the residuals fall beyond the confidence interval for the individual, we reject the new hypothesis, which in this case states that these cases are members from this population. So these two points are not from this population. That is the interpretation of this. We clear so far? Does it make sense? <coughs> so any score above the upper limit means that the person improved more than was expected given his or her previous level, the average group changed and the expected change for the people with that 
score n1 and below the same value. Even in the context of, a, of an increase, this person didn't increase enough to be normative, to be typical change, to a typical change. So this method is not new. It was proposed in the context of uh, neuropsychology and neuropsych neuropsychology uh, for previous cases with two time points. Uh, there's a paper, this paper in, uh, in psychological assessment, showing that this method works very well uh, regarding the type 1 errors. So when you set confidence level, you have the right type of, uh, right, the right rate of type 1 error. So what we are doing here is go one step beyond and extend it to multiple regression. Not two time points, but several time points. So we are trying to predict the scores here with previous time points. This is not an actual autoregressive model because we, don't, we are not saying that this is predicted by this in any way. We are not modeling what happened before this time point. We are just trying to predict what's going to happen here in the previous information. Okay? Sorry to cut you off. Yeah. So, could you explain what's SYIT, YIT, that's some This is, so for computing the confidence. I think it's easy if you go back to the picture at the start. Yeah. Yes. So the first confidence band is based on the fact that we've got a, a beta hat and not a beta, right? It's just controlling for estimation noise across everything. Now for that one, you could control for the noise, if there's heteroscedasticity and so on, you can get heteroscedastic robust standard errors and do things correctly. To get the second one, you're having to make assumptions about the error term and the properties of the error term. And my guess is that it's assuming that the errors are homoscedastic. Right? You're adding in the same amount. But actually, you could argue that, you know, out in the tails, you should be having a bigger one. Right? No, no, so it's not uh, sorry. So this, these lines are curved, too. There's more dispersion here than here. Yeah, but I think it's coming across the beta hat rather than your assumption. About, well, if you, if you come back to your equation, Actually, you're having... No, to one with an error term at the start. Oh, you don't I have, don't have it. I have it. I have it at the end of the presentation. I can okay. go to that. But I mean, you're going to have to say something about what that error term is for individual i. This is a This is a presentation. Yes. So that's assuming. Yes. The one. That one is saying everyone has the same individual variance in the square. Just mention it does not convert to zero and sometimes. No. It does not go to zero and sometimes goes in. No. It's fixed. Actually what I will show is that uh, no, it doesn't go to zero. Yeah, sorry. The confidence interval for beta itself is converted to zero. Yeah. And some goes to zero. The confidence interval for individual change that some goes to zero. It's fixed. Mm -hmm. It, no, it, it doesn't go to zero. It gets to a point in which you cannot make it uh, thinner by adding more time or it's, more data. Yeah. It's the variance of epsilon it, yeah. right? That always has to contribute. Uh, yeah. Okay, so the first thing we did with this idea was applying it to empirical studies, empirical data. We are using data from the Connecticut, Connecticut Longitudinal Study which is an ongoing, ongoing study involving a cohort, of, a very large cohort of children, for which measures of learning, attention, and reading abil disabilities and abilities are taken. We are using this sample size for this study, and these kids were assessed as first grade and then annually assessed all the way up to grade nine in this data. I'm not going to go into the demographics, but basically, the, the main idea here is that the, they are very similar to the US population by the time this is done. So the measures I'm using here are verbal abilities at grades 1, 3, 5, 7, and 9, uh, particularly the Wechsler scale as a measure of general verbal ability, so the verbal IQ score in Wechsler, and three subtests from the Wolfgang Johnson uh, reading scale. 
as part the more narrow abilities. This is lower abilities. This is the way data look from the 445 sample. As you can see, well, it is very common in the context of education uh, age norm the scores, so you have IQ scores instead of raw scores. So in this score, the higher is the score, the more ability. Here, the mean of each grade is 100. So you can see the deviation from each person to the mean. And because this was addressed to uh, education, to educational uh, readership, we are using these uh, scores, but the same method ca can be used here too. Raw scores, that's the number correct or the percent correct? The raw score, is it the, num is the number of items answered correctly or the percent of items answered correctly? In these three cases, it is. So, so they aren't, they're or technically they're ordinal, not interval. That's something that, because the item right. difficulty, the differences in the item difficulty are not being taken into account. Right. So the IQ metric is, is a better one for, for parametric statistics from that, from that perspective. Thanks for that. I didn't notice that. That's, 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 that's not the general reason to use it. Right? But my point here is that this, this technique should be, can be applied to both types of data. Uh, and I was focusing here on the shape. So this is increasing and this is stationary or doesn't, it's not expected to increase. I mean, it's, not, it's going to be 100 always. And the method could be used to both types, even to decreasing uh, scores. <coughs> so, we are going to use, we are going to see, to use this linear regression method to predict this data, to uh, detect individual changes here and see how it works, we'll see what happens. The first thing we need to know is we need to find out how many previous measures are useful. We have four previous measures in grade nine, but maybe we don't need all of them. So, very simple approach to this. Just, we just need to use uh, stepwise multiple regression and use the just R square as a measure of how well, of, of if the further measures help improve the predictions or not. And then when we have the best model, we compute the confidence interval for the videos based on that model. So for grade three, we only have one previous grade. For grade five, when we add, the, uh, we first include grade three, we then include grade one, and the increase in speed is significant. For grade seven, we can use grades five, three, and one. But for grade one, uh, for grade, grade nine, after we enter grade seven, five, and three, grade one is not very useful. So the model does not get better. So it seems that with this data, with this type of data, up to three measures are enough. We don't need more. We don't need to go back further in time. Does make sense? So we are going to estimate the CII for this, 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 and this. No, not this. And this is the, one of the ways that we can plot it. Is okay. This, these are the predicted and observed scores for grade three, and this is very similar to the first plot I showed because this is not the score in grade one, time one, but it's a linear transformation of that scores. So these are the. This this will be. In this case, show the exact same. Uh, so the, it has the value that was predicted for him. We have 16 cases above the confidence interval and 16 cases below the confidence interval. In this case, in the remaining three plots, this is actually a linear combination of the previous locations, right? A, a linear combination that minimizes the errors for all the cases. And we can see that the type one errors are close to five percent in all cases. Another way of plotting this, or studying this, that is actually probably more informative for applied practitioners would be to plot the trajectory of one person. Because we, are, we want to work at the individual level. So let's take case 5570. I don't know if it's a boy or other. And what I have plotted here is the percentile 95 for this, for this group, for the whole group in the verbal scale, percentile 5 and the median. So these three black lines are group indicators. And the red, the first, this first one is his or her score at grade one. With this information and 
the information from the whole group we can compute the, in, the confidence interval for this person at grade three. So when grade three comes and we see that this person actually was the patient was very accurate for this person. But with this data, with this chunk of data, we can compute the next the next interval. Which at grade three we don't actually know this, right? We already know have this blue line and this interval. So we with the next prediction. And at grade five, this person improves much better than it was expected for him or her. So at grade seven, the model corrected, up, uploaded, or yeah. incorporated this information. So in the next step, it is correct again. And then grade nine, well, the, the group catches up with him, but still the model uh, tells you what is the interval for him. Is it clear? Any question? Comment so far? So one of the things that I like about this, or I would like to this, I, I would like to think that this is useful because uh, this could be used in a school because this is not complicated to compute. And in any school, in any uh, orientation department in a school, they could have like panels like this for different kids. Here we have three different kids. This is the plot I have shown you before. Three different kids in all of the variables. This is the general ability, and these are the three specific abilities. So we could have. We can see that these two kids started very similarly, but the evolution, the time evolution, is very different for each of them. Um, we can see that this person, for example, uh, is very good. He has or she has a very high level, but not in all of the abilities in some of them. So maybe some of these are spending this now performance. So there's a lot of things going on here, and people who know more than I do about reading abilities can store a lot, a lot of information from here. And make decisions. This can help. Ideally, this should help make decisions about which kids should uh, receive an intervention for reading disabilities, for example. So, to sum up, to sum up, the confidence interval for the individuals based on linear regression allows to first estimate the expected change for individuals in the sample at each occasion. Second, compute the expected uh, sorry, compute the individual discrepancies or residuals between the expected and observed values. Third determine which individuals show a typical change, higher or lower than expected. Fourth, study the study trajectory in different variables for the same individual. And fifth, estimate the trajectory for different individuals that were even without being in the original sample. Right? And this is one of the things that I think is uh, interesting or useful. So, I will so here, I'm, we are computing this with information that we already have. But we could, once we have the model, and assuming that we have new cases from, our, from the same population, we could actually estimate the whole trajectory when we only have this spot, and then update it at each spot. Uh, so we can uh, actually forecast the development of independent of uh, reading abilities in this case. If this person, if the new person comes from the same population, that would be one nice application of this. The predictions for each individual takes into consideration the average change for the group, the person's previous score, the expected change of for those particular scores, and the multivariate patterns of association. Uh, and in this case, one of the findings for this data is that three previous occasions are enough. And one of the, the main contributions of this part is that we have extended this method for more than two times. Less. Nobody has done this before. It is turned out to, not to be a good idea. With me or very good with them. but I think that this is interesting. Uh, another nice thing about this is that these estimations can be done by many statistical problems, at least if you base it in these squares. The different estimation procedures may, may not be that easy, but as long as you use linear regression and least square estimation, this is available for a lot of people. Uh, how much time do you have? Uh, I forgot to reset my pump. We'll give you uh, say another three minutes. Okay. Uh, so another thing we could do is change the confidence level. So if we want to gain uh, power, we want to gain sensitivity, we don't need to work with a 95%. We could uh, set all the rejections on in the lower part of the plot to the to the that only the persons that are not uh, increasing at the right uh, rate. Now, some things that this model does, this tool does not do, is first characterize 
the change. This is not a model for change. We are not describing the change. We are just trying to predict at this time. Frame. And it doesn't explain why people doesn't change as they should. You can add covariance to the prediction, to the model. But the interpretation of this is not straightforward, because if you add the right covariates, the residuals are going to be lower for the person. So you're not going to detect them as changing. Does that make sense? So it's possible to add covariates here, but I have to think about how it works, how it would work. Because it's the, it, the, the, the way it works is the opposite of normal uh, regression. Um, what it does is identifying individual, ch individual cases who change it more than who change it more than expected or less than expected. And it, the, one of the nicest things that it can be applied to any longitudinal data set, regardless of the actual shape of change. So the, I said this before, if we have a sample that is representative from the population and we draw new cases from this population, once we have the model, we can estimate, we can forecast for this new cases and see whether the model is accurate or not. Uh, and one of the applications of this, the most straightforward, would be to detect cases with dyslexia, for example, uh, and well, decide possible interventions for this case based on this method. Now, some of the ways I would like to, some of the things I would like to explore with this is uh, incorporate this method when there is a model for change. And how can we compute these estimates? For example, in structural equations, when you have a structure of paths leading to each of all of the uh, measures, it should be easy to compute it if all of them are observed variables. I don't think it's easy at all when you have latent variables in the model, but some, that is something that I think is worth exploring. Uh, and another thing I would like to do is to explore the relation with mixture models. I mean, a mixture model is a model that try to find, uh, tries to find different subpopulations within a population. And that is, this is the same thing that this model is doing conceptually. So I'd like to know if these two methods tell us the same thing or not. Okay. That was everything I wanted to talk about. Any questions? Okay, so I'll go a quick one. Can you go back to your equation? The one with the epsilon and the error. The one with the epsilon. Is it? Epsilon. It has an error term in it. One second. Uh, there. Suppose we could perfectly estimate this. Then the only thing to worry about is this. And so we're asking, when this gets big enough, there's a flag, something's gone wrong, okay? And doing the confidence interval approach, we're basically saying, if it's 1.96 times the estimate of the estimated standard deviation, that's big enough, okay? Now what if you have one person who year after year is just really steady on the test? They have small variability of epsilon. And then there's someone else who's just all over the place, right? And one year they're going to be way up, one year going to go down. Well, that person you're going to misidentify as needing attention when they don't need attention, right? So I think the heteroscedasticity here may matter. Now, given your results, it suggests to me that you were working in a setting where there wasn't much heteroscedasticity, there wasn't much variability in the area. But with your data, you could check that. Mm -hmm. And you could run simulations with wildly heteroscedastic data and just see then that you're not getting it adding up to 5%, right? Mm -hmm. um, anyway, that's what I want to say. I mean, I, clearly this is very, very useful. Uh, and I was persuaded by your particular data example, uh, just a more matter of the robustness across, right, and, and this sort of data, maybe that's the way it always is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I'd just like to suggest another place you might want to go. So um, we know that um, the growth of children, especially in reading, is not linear, mm -hmm. especially based on where they start, right? So there are people who have done some work in quantile regression 
where they sort of you know calculated those regression curves you know um, completely separately for the for the different levels of initial performance and um, it would be interesting to just sort of see how this might be applied I mean I know this is sort of one kind of slice of it but but I think it works better than than OLS for things where you've got growth that you know is going to look very different at different um, ends of you know different parts of the distribution in terms of where you start mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, makes sense. We'll make this the last question. Yeah, um, I have a comment. I think it's kind of related to what Colin said, um, which is about the effect of measurement error on the method, because um, you know, if you don't take into account measurement error, it's basically confounded with the prediction error, right? So if you get a huge epsilon, it could be a prediction error, but it could be also be that you're just not measuring. It's a mixture numbers. of both. Right, yeah. Um, so, you know, one direction that you may want to explore is how measurement error can have an effect on this. And how would you, what is your intuition? How do how you tell it? Mm -hmm. Because I will They're go with latent variables. <laughs> and yeah, latent variables. But I really don't know how to use this with, with latent variables. Because you are using the whole matrix of uh, scores at the previous times, so you will need, I think, the factor scores, and that opens Pandora blocks. Yes. Factors can open up. Uh, that's very interesting. I, I, I definitely want to go that way. Okay, we're done. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.